you could get everyone's attentions, if you could uh, finish topping off your coffee and grab a seat, we'll get started. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, and as the uh, Dean of the Mitchell Institute, I'd like to welcome all of you to uh, our uh, Mitchell Hour uh, today. Um, we're very, very pleased to have with us the Honorable uh, Matt Donovan. Uh, as the Under Secretary of the Air Force, he's got some perspectives we're all looking forward to hearing, uh, particularly what's ahead uh, in terms of FY19 uh, budget priorities. Now, I've had the good fortune of knowing the Secretary for uh, many, many years, uh, and I could spend a lot of time reflecting on his accomplishments, but I'm only going to mention two, and then I'll put those in context. First, he was an F-15 aerial demonstration pilot and an F-15 squadron commander. So he's got what we say in the business, good hands. And he's got a good grip on the essence of what the Air Force is all about. And second, as all of you know in here, just prior to his current appointment, he served on the professional staff of the Senate Armed Services Committee. So he knows not just the Air Force well, but the Congress as well, and that's quite a combination. And we're all very fortunate to have somebody with his situational awareness of threats, resources, and the demands they're putting on the Air Force as our undersecretary. So to tell us how it's all going to work out in 19, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Matt Donovan. Good to see you, Matt. Well, thanks, Dave. Good morning, everybody. Um, you know, um, it's an interesting time uh, to be in the Department of Defense, as, as you can imagine, uh, with a lot going on. Uh, first, thanks to Dave and the Mitchell Institute. Uh, we really appreciate all the support you give us and, and helping us uh, look forward with uh, future American air power. It's, uh, it's very helpful. Uh, there's a lot of topics that we can discuss this morning. Uh, a lot of good stories coming out of the Olympics. You know. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess they're going to release a budget today. Um, and as we speak, Starman is uh, skipping past Mars and heading right for the asteroid belt in his, uh, in his Tesla. That was a pretty impressive launch. I don't know if you guys saw that. I mean, uh, the formation landing with the two boosters coming back and landed together, that was, that was pretty impressive. Uh, and two out of three ain't bad. So, yeah. um, so it is a noticeable, uh, notable Monday today with the fiscal year 19 president budget request rolling out today. Um, you know, uh, the best laid plans, I was supposed to be here a week after the budget was rolled out. And, uh, I'm, you know, it's not actually officially rolled out to later today, but we'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, I, think, um, I think before we discuss the FY19 budget, we really have to start with where it's, uh, where it's derived from, and that's our new National Defense Strategy Direction. The National Security Strategy, the National Defense Strategy, and the newly released Nuclear Posture Review recognize the shift in the global balance of power in ways that are unfavorable to American interests. These foundational documents respond to the growing political, economic, and military competition, particularly with China and Russia. Collectively, the new strategy sets the course to regain momentum to reverse those trends and protect our vital national interests. Within the framework of the national security strategy, the new defense strategy sets clear strategic guidance for the Department of Defense. Great power competition is now the primary focus of U.S. national security. This is a fundamentally different challenge than the regional conflicts that occupied our, our planning for the last two and a half decades. At the same time, the Department will sustain efforts to deter and counter North Korea, Iran, and counter uh, violent extremist organizations. More specific to the Air Force, the new defense strategy gives us clear direction to increase the lethality of our force. It supports modernization of the nuclear triad, including nuclear command control and communication systems, emphasizes capabilities needed for the high-end fight, focuses the force on readiness, advances space as a priority domain, directs us to fight terrorist organizations at a lower cost and by, with, and through allies and partners, focuses on development of resilient, survivable command and control systems, and pushes for greater prototype and experimentation to deliver capability faster to the warfighter. 
The NDS is guiding our efforts in all, all realms. This includes laying the groundwork for the fiscal year, 19, 20, uh, fiscal year 2019 and future defense budgets. What you'll see roll out today is a strategy-driven budget. Although the NDS was released in December, we assembled the 19 budget by working with earlier drafts all through the process to ensure it stayed congruent. This budget truly reflects the guidance in the NDS. For the Air Force portion, the FY19 budget request builds the size and mix of capabilities we need to compete, deter, and win in this global strategic environment. It builds, it builds on the progress begun in 2018 to accelerate the readiness of the force, increase our lethality, and modernize us to, to deliver greater, more affordable performance as directed in the NDS. In the rollout, you'll see emphasis in the Air Force budget request in our priority areas. First is readiness. Accelerating warfighting readiness is foremost about having enough trained people. This budget builds a steady, sustainable total force end strength ramp. It addresses the air crew shortage and fills gaps in space, nuclear, cyber, and intelligence career fields. It funds flying hours and key infrastructure needed for relevant and realistic training. It maximizes procurement of preferred munitions and funds aircraft depot maintenance, parts, and logistics support. The budget also supports airmen and family readiness in a number of areas. Maintaining a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent is the top priority of the defense strategy. The nuclear triad has kept our nation and our allies safe for over 70 years. We cannot allow it to become obsolete. The budget request modernizes our bomber fleet and continues development of the long-range standoff missile and the Minuteman III replacement and ground-based strategic deterrent system to enhance the flexibility and range of tailored deterrence options. As directed in the Nuclear Posture Review, it also improves our Nuclear Command and Control and Communication System, NC3, which is a no-fail system. This is how we ensure nuclear weapons can be reliably employed if they're required on our nation's worst day. It's really the fourth leg of the triad, if you will, the glue that holds it all together. This budget increases lethality through both capability and capacity improvements for our weapon systems. We've been underfunded in modernization, and this budget helps smooth, smooth flow the bow wave of modernization we're facing over the next 10 years. The budget proposal advances an integrated family of systems that taken together will help maintain air superiority in highly contested environments into the future. The budget also includes a substantial increase for space capabilities to align with a fundamentally new space warfighting construct to meet the threat from China and Russia. This budget also proposes to change the way we execute battlefield management, command, and control in the multi-domain environment. We will develop and transition to an advanced battle management system to stay ahead of both our adversaries and the changing character of warfare. Two key elements in the national defense strategy include strengthening our alliances and retaining irregular warfare as a core competency at a lower cost. We've decided to continue the light attack experiment that will open new avenues for the Air Force and our allies and partners in the low end fight at a cost effective price point. This will also enable an extended partner network capable of meeting those challenges and will free up some of our combat units needed for the high-end fight. The light, attack, the light attack effort will be coalition at its core from the very beginning. This budget also increases emphasis on basic and applied research to drive long-term innovation and dominance in air and space power. Also, at the NDS's direction, Deputy Defense Secretary Pat Shanahan is leading a department-wide effort to reform business practices and maximize effectiveness. The Air Force is leading many of these initiatives to ensure we're delivering maximum performance with the funds entrusted to us and getting the best use of every taxpayer dollar. Looking ahead in preparation for the fiscal year 2020 POM build, we're in the middle of executing a zero-based review of programs, budget accounts, and manpower authorizations for the first time in more than two decades. This is not as much about our budget as it is about our strategy going forward. The idea here is to get after the relevancy of what we're doing as we prepare for the FY20 budget and future year's defense plan. 
Secretary Mattis has been absolutely clear that everything we do must contribute to increased lethality for our military forces. We're evaluating each and every program and requirement through the lens of alignment with NDS priorities. Everything is on the table during this review and programs will have to fight their way back into the budget. On the acquisition side, our new defense strategy prioritizes speed of delivery, continuous adaptation, and frequent modular upgrades. We have to shift our thinking and processes and we're working through that. To take advantages of all the advances in the tech world, we're improving the ways in which we develop and acquire these capabilities and working to get beyond the bureaucratic risk-averse processes that at the end of the day are really barriers to speed and innovation. A key part of this effort is delegation of milestone, milestone decision authority for which Ellen Lord has been taking the lead in, in the charge for this to push authorities for major programs back down to the services. We're also working internally to push decisions to the lowest levels, which will shorten timelines to fielding capabilities. We're also connecting the Air Force with non-traditional contributors to defense to help us get at cutting edge technologies from across the commercial sector and incubate new ideas into the process. On the organization side, we're building a new construct, the Air Force Warfighting Integration Capability, or AFWIC, that will gain us greater unity of effort in designing the future force. Our current model integrates missions and capabilities too late and at too high of a decision level in the planning cycle. AFWIC is a centralized design engine that will help us merge missions, requirements, capabilities, design, and concept of operations development much earlier to become more cohesive in how we meet the objectives of the National Defense Strategy. Finally, we launched an in-depth review of our science and technology strategy that will be completed later this year. This review will help us make sure our priorities and relationships with the scientific community, the universities, and our industry partners are headed in the right direction. To come back full circle to where I started, we now have a budget deal, and we thank Congress for coming together and to pass this two-year bipartisan budget agreement. Uh, some of them did so at considerable political risk. This agreement gives us a defense top line of $700 billion for 2018, which is higher than the President's budget request, and $716 billion for 2019. And we're working through right now what we need to pull forward to accelerate readiness and reduce the, that bow wave that I mentioned. However, we now need the actual appropriations as quickly as possible to execute. This is still another continuing resolution uh, that included the uh, two-year budget agreement language. By the time we get our funds distribution from a signed appropriations act, we'll be halfway through the fiscal year. We really need regular order to be able to fund the new strategy and build lethality and depth for the future. The necessity of getting appropriations on time for the fiscal year cannot be overstated. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you again for braving the rainy weather to come out and have a discussion with me. And uh, I look forward to your questions and tell me what's on your mind. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I can answer questions. John? Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Uh, John Turpak, Air Force Magazine. The uh, National Defense Strategy didn't give much in the way of force, force sizing. Well, OSD and the Joint Staff is, uh, are both working through uh, the force sizing construct. Uh, as you can imagine, it, uh, they have to decide which scenarios they're going to go against with this thing. But, but generally speaking, um, the, the Secretary has, uh, has coined a couple of new terms. One is capable capacity. In other words, he's trying to ensure that the, the uh, force structure that we have now is as capable and as lethal as possible. Uh, so uh, you'll see more words as, as the force sizing construct starts coming out in, into the future, and then you'll likely see that reflected more in the FY20 budget. So no, no increase really in squadron, but, but more uh, supply, more, more missiles? Well, uh, for, uh, for the Air Force, of course, we're, we're still buying F-35s, and we're not retiring anything else with it. So that is increasing our capacity. In the back. 
Thanks. Hi, sir. I'm Pat Host from Jane's. There was a report this weekend that the Air Force was going to use the B-21 to retire the B-2. I was wondering if that was accurate, and why wouldn't you use it to retire the B-52 instead? Well, generally speaking, uh, you, you're talking about a leaked document, and we don't we don't comment on leaked documents. But um, when you when you take a look at uh, at the requirements that we'll need in the future, uh, we have a stand-in requirement. We have a penetrating requirement. Uh, in order to hold targets at risk in the future. And then we have a standoff requirement. In other words, we'll use munitions to do the penetrating. Um, so, uh, you know, the B-52 is a great standoff uh, uh, platform. It can carry a lot of weapons. Uh, it's been upgraded with new rotary launchers and, and those kind of things. And uh, so, you know, it, there'll be more released uh, later today with the budget, but that's, that's the general rationale behind it. Uh, the budget has not come out yet, so you you got a you got an embargoed briefing, Craig. Hey, don't get me in trouble and get me in front of the Secretary of Defense, okay? <laughs> Sir. talk about nuclear command and control. The Air Force has been struggling with this for many, many years, and every time they seem to make some progress, they're, they end up with some hiccups, uh, particularly from uh, STRATCOM and others who've said, you know, uh, unless we can absolutely trust it, we're not ready to take it yet. Right, right. Uh, and so now we're still relying in some cases on old analog 70s technology, mainly because it, it's, it appears to be unhackable. So uh, I, I think we're, we're right to do this, but I'm still concerned that we've made many attempts and we've gotten nowhere yet. Right. Well, we have, we have a military requirement for secure and protected comms, but there's nothing that's more um, uh, crucial a requirement than, than NC3. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, part of the problem is, is what we've done is we're going out to take a look at where all the different parts and pieces. It's, it's, a, it's a disparate system that's spread across the, uh, the Navy the Air Force as, as well as STRATCOM, and uh, we've actually established a PEO, uh, Program Executive Officer for NC3, and, uh, and we're taking a look at, make sure that we can lasso where all these pieces are so that all the different pieces that need to be upgraded are upgraded. And, it, and, it, and it's cross-domain as well, right? I mean, there, there's, uh, you know, in the electronic domain, but there's also space communications that are involved and, and all that. So NPR gives us clear direction to go after that and do it, and uh, you'll see that reflected in the budget. Goldfein says he wants to focus on the highway, not the truck. If uh, that's going to be your focus, how are you going to uh, explain to uh, Congress and an electorate uh, that you're going to still have the same directorate, especially when you see press reports you know, of systems of systems replacing dedicated aircraft, as in, has been reported about JSTAR's recap? Right. Well, one of the things that, uh, that we're looking at is, is network is the future. Network warfare is the future. Um, the threat has also increased at a, at a faster rate than we even expected as far as their uh, surface air missile systems, their integrated air defense systems. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're looking at, at all of our platforms from a survivability uh, perspective. And uh, if it's not survivable, then it's not going to be that useful to us. Uh, so we need to take advantage of, of uh, networking together sensors that are already available out there, uh, as well as, uh, um, uh, you know, battle, uh, battle management uh, command and control, uh, so that uh, we have resilient networks, uh, sort, of like, sort of like the internet and the way the internet started. I, I, you know, I, back, way back in college a long time ago, I did a, uh, a project on the internet and, and where it started from, this was, this was back when the World Wide Web was, you know, just barely in its infancy. But, you know, the Internet was actually uh, developed to be a nuclear command and control and communication system that was resilient. In other words, it was Internet work, so it could take a different route if a node disappeared due to a nuclear strike or something. Well, you know, we've got to get back to thinking that way for resiliency purposes. 
Yes. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Sandra Erwin with Space News. Uh, the uh, NDAA, the National Defense Strategy, they all talk about space, and you mentioned in the, in the budget there's going to be a, um, an opportunity to close gaps in, in space. So um, can you talk about some, in general, what we're going to see in this new budget that is going to address the gaps in space, and is that going to be noticeable compared to previous budgets? Thanks. Well, a as you know, a lot of our a lot of our budgeting for space is in the, in the black side. Uh, but generally speaking, um, we have to make sure that anything we launch into space is, is capable of being defended. So if we're going to launch things into space that uh, cannot be defended, then we, then we put those capabilities at risk. And, and that applies to both the commercial and the defense side as well, too. So what you'll see in the budget when it comes out, and, uh, and you, you can get a lot more uh, detail from, uh, from General Jay Raymond, the Aft Space Commander on this, is that we're shifting that focus to make sure that things that get launched are, are going to be able to be defended, as well as provide uh, capabilities that, that ensure that uh, for us in space. Well, I, I mean, it's, um, you know, uh, I get really uncomfortable with this because of classification levels and that sort of thing. But generally speaking, uh, you need to be able to either uh, detect threats that are coming in so that you can make things maneuverable as one way uh, of, of doing that. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm getting a little bit out ahead of my headlights here on that. Mr. Secretary, George Nicholson of the Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. About a year ago, I was in a meeting with General Neller, Commandant of the Marine Corps, and he started his presentation by saying the biggest threat to the Marines in the future is our dependence upon GPS and SATCOM. The next week, I was in a meeting with Admiral Richardson, and he laughed and says, I've got exactly the same problem. Two weeks ago at CSIS, I reiterated the question to General Neller, and he says, nothing's changed. We need to look at alternative means of, of communications and, and, and networking. We can talk about defending space and everything else, but in terms of innovative things uh, and going back to, to alternatives, your comments on this? Well, uh, I mean, I agree with you. Once you get uh, dependent on a single technology, uh, then, of course, that becomes the, um, the focus of any threat, right? Um, uh, I flew airplanes for a long time. I didn't have GPS. I had a window and a map. I mean, you know, we, we, we can still do that, you know, through, through uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures uh, to be able to operate in contested and, and uh, uh, contested and uh, degraded operations environments. So, uh, but your point is well taken, and, and we do have some efforts ongoing in, in, uh, uh, in application uh, 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 applied research and that to, to take a look at some of these uh, potential um, alternatives or complementary uh, type capabilities to, to GPS as well. There's some really some pretty interesting stuff going on out there with that. But, but point taken. Yes. Hi, I'm Mr. Secretary Mark Selinger, Defense Daily. You mentioned a new uh, advanced battle, manage battle management system. I was wondering if you could describe what exactly that is and how it fits with the, uh, the JSTARS replacement that's been talked about. Well, uh, like I was talking about, it's all about the networks and it's all about uh, fusing sensors together so that you get more information to the decision makers quicker and in a resilient fashion. So what we have to be able to do is, is we have to be able to fuse the information from all these disparate sensors that we have that are kind of growing up on, on different airplanes, different platforms, uh, whether unmanned platforms, manned platforms, and we need to be able to make that uh, uh, protected and secure communications. So uh, the key on this is really going to be advanced data links and, and network uh, connectivity uh, to be able to do that. We're working very hard. What you'll see reflected in the budget is some of these technologies where uh, budget increases have been have been laid in to get after this. Is 
Yeah, it's not necessarily a new airplane. It's sort of uh, pulling it all together in a different way. In the back, Courtney. Hi, sir. Courtney Alvin oh, wow. uh, with Inside the Air Force. Um, you mentioned a little bit the, the zero-based review and, and how that will inform the, um, the 2020 budgeting process. Um, but I wonder, um, just in, in regards to the NDS, where we can see kind of the fingerprints of the NDS in this year's budget and, and where it maybe drove um, increases or, or uh, uh, reduced investment in certain areas. And then um, as you, as you look ahead to the, the 19 kind of markup process with Congress, do you expect that they'll be asking for um, specific justification and for how the NDS is directly tied to, uh, to this year's budget? Yeah, we absolutely expect that. In fact, uh, well, one of the SAS PSMers stand there uh, told me that that's going to be a focus of, of the SASC, at least uh, for the, uh, this NDAA, is to be able to tie those threads between what's in the budget and the NDS. Um, we, we got a, a pretty sizable increase in defense budget, and we need to be able to justify that and assure Congress and the American people that we're going to spend it in the most cost-effective manner and uh, with full accountability on this. So that's really important. Um, as far as, uh, you, you'll get more details as, as the budget uh, gets released and when they hang everything on the website, but you'll see that it's clearly in there that we're gonna increase the lethality of the force that we're shifting more towards uh, the great power competition uh, sort of attitude against uh, China and Russia. Hi, Jen DiMassio with Aviation Week. I um, wanted to ask um, about the bomber again, go back to that. Uh, how do you ensure, um, if, if retirements of the B-2 go forward, how do you ensure that the B-21 is ready to come online when a lot of technology programs have a history of, of uh, overrunning on schedule? Well, it, it's, it's of course uh, all dependent on that, right? We've got to make sure that the B-21 is, is um, on, on cost, on performance, and on schedule like we do with all our, all our programs. So any, any plan to retire current capability would have to be linked to uh, a replacement capability coming on board. Thank you. Thank you for coming this morning, Mr. Secretary. It's great to hear you. Um, and thanks for all your good work at Student Gap pushing west for me when I was a Viper driver a long time ago. Um, I, r I run a small business focusing on the warfighter, and I have an observation for you that leads to a question. Uh, we've, we've been very happy with the initiatives uh, that the Secretary has done, for example, like AFWorks, interfacing with industry and those kinds of things. We have literally in the past two years stumbled on technologies at some of the DOD and DOE laboratories that the developers, the physicists, and the scientists that were working on that uh, activity didn't quite realize what they had developed. And so when I say stumble on those things, it makes me just want to make you aware of that observation and then ask you, is there any connectivity programs that you're looking to increase between the warfighter, whether it be major, major commands and the laboratories, again, being DOD and DOE, mm -hmm. so a little bit of, you know, crossing lanes there. Right, right. It's an excellent point, and it's something that Secretary Wilson has been asking repeatedly in the department. So um, we're, we're tied sort of to our JSID system, you know, where you look at the threat, and then you identify gaps and capabilities, and then you uh, come up with a plan to plug those gaps. And, that, and she goes, well, that's sort of a reactive type thing, isn't it? And, uh, and everybody kind of nods and they go, well, but that's the system we have and stuff. And so what she's driving towards is uh, how do I introduce these technologies that you're talking about here that maybe somebody stumbled across, how do I get those into the system? So in other words, somebody brings me something I look at and, I, and, and they go, I'm going to show you something that you didn't even know you needed. And, uh, and, and that's the point that she's trying to make, and that's why her focus on science and technology and AFWORKS and DIUX and all these things, so that uh, we know that the commercial sector is just developing all kinds of technologies 
I read a really interesting uh, article last night, maybe some of you read it, on the 73 implications of a driverless future. Um, you know, and, and, and the author went into great detail about the implications and through inductive reasoning, uh, getting to, uh, getting to uh, things that you wouldn't even have thought of just initially at it. And uh, we need that kind of thinking inside uh, the Defense Department as well, too. But, but your point is well taken, and the Secretary is all about that. And that's why she's been driving these efforts. So. Good. Sir. Good morning, sir. Stu Kowal from General Atomics. Uh, sir, as you know, when we're able to export uh, U.S. unmanned systems abroad, it not only uh, increases the interoperability between our services, but there's a, a budget impact in that, you know, the fleet of systems available is larger. Um, we have seen over the last several years that China has been uh, advancing their UAS export uh, efforts and, uh, I mean, potentially threatening our technological edge. I was wondering if you could comment on the evolving UAS export policy and and the impacts that might be on the global ISR grid and, and Air Force budget planning? Well, absolutely. I, I guess China has a little different Export Control Act uh, limitation than, than we have. Um, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of, the, uh, one of the main lines of effort in the national defense strategy that Secretary Mattis has put forth is strengthening alliance and partners. And uh, we do that through all different kinds of ways, uh, uh, you know, making new technologies available to them, um, sometimes making current technologies available to them and, and increasing their capacity uh, and ensuring that they're interoperable with us, right? Um, and so I, I, you know, it's not really in the Defense Department's uh, bailiwick, you know, to, to look at export control, but I do know that this administration is, is working very hard to try to open these kind of things up. Uh, back when I was on the committee, it, it, was, it was difficult as well, too, because when you talk about foreign military sales, that's Title 22 that, that falls under the uh, Foreign Affairs Committees, and, uh, uh, you know, so you get that cross-committee jurisdictional uh, boundary that you have to cross as well too. We're very supportive. Uh, the Air Force has has uh, has really exploded with new FMS cases, and trying to help along those lines of strengthening uh, strengthening allies and partners. So, uh, UAS is uh, of course you know. Do we want to have some control over? It? Sure, we absolutely do, but not so restrictive that we end up giving advantages to our potential adversaries who are out there really uh, really banging it up like China is, right? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Sir? Bill Sweetman with North Rock Grumman. Um, I'd like to ask a sort of philosophical question about ABMS and uh, how you see the road forward. Um, because, you know, as we know, you know, the uh, platforms that we have that are persistent and not necessarily very survivable, the platforms that we have that are survivable are not very necessarily persistent, and um, all of them have, what to a greater or lesser degree, um, the difficulties in talking to other platforms. So is this some kind of, you know, holistic approach across all of those problems, and how long will it take, and how, how do you propose to manage it? Well, you're absolutely right. Um, we We tend to we tend to develop programs sort of in a stovepipe. We develop platforms or capabilities that are sort of in a stovepipe, and then we worry about bolting on connectivity after. Uh, you know, uh, F-22 and F-35 are a perfect example, right? The difference between iFiddle and, I, and iMaddle and being able to talk to each other and, and coming up with that. Now, when they're developed at different periods and different times, you have different threats. You know, that's sort of understandable. We're trying to get to, uh, uh, and that's what our AFWIC is getting at, so that when we develop these capabilities, we're more cross-functional across all domains and we're thinking about these things ahead of time. Now, as far as the ABMS, you know, we're not going to be able to just field this ABMS and turn the light off on one and turn the other one on. There will be a transition period here uh, because at the same time, we're still owe the combatant commanders all the capabilities that, uh, that he's come to expect the Air Force to provide. So uh, there will be a, 
a purposeful planned transition as we start bringing these on into the uh, into the system. But ABMS is, you know, it's not a system you can point at. You, you know, you said philosophically, it, it really is. It's more of a concept of, of development. And oh, by the way, it's not just the Air Force. I mean, we've got to bring the entire department along on this. With, uh, and we're working very closely with the, uh, with the Navy. And we're also working very closely with the Army on their multi-domain battle type thing. It, they realize it all requires good connectivity and, and the ability to uh, talk to each other. Yes, in the back. Lauren Williams with Federal Computer Week. I'm interested in getting to know where other transaction authorities and BIUX fit in this budget, that is how the Air Force plans to use them for FY18 and 19. Well, it, the issue you're getting at is when are we going to fully implement the NDAA reforms? And, um, you know, my SAS friends are always give me the whale eye on that. Like, um, and, and I'll tell you, Ellen Lord is doing a wonderful job of, of taking these reforms that were so voluminous, and there, there were many of them in the FY16, FY17, NDAA, as, as you might uh, recall. Uh, but we have to work through that to see how are we going to implement. Uh, other transaction authorities is one of them. Uh, the, the other thing that, that Ellen Lord is working in, she can tell you about this much more eloquently, but it all starts with the training. So she's focused on Defense Acquisition University. And if you have, uh, I forget how many tens of thousands of contract officers we have in the Department of Defense, but there's a lot of them. And they all need to be trained on how to use these authorities. Uh, and so she's starting with that at, at, at DAU to get that in the ground floor. And it will take some time to kind of diffuse that throughout the force. Uh, and then it's also about the risk averse uh, processes that we talked about and we need to take a look at how we reward program managers right uh, and we need and secretary wilson is talking about this all the time that it's it's okay to fail as long as you fail smartly and you learn something from it and you have off ramps ability to be able to change directions quickly um, when we build you know these giant major defense programs that uh, you know are measured in in decades from go through the life cycle I mean I mean it's just not going to work anymore uh, just like the Chinese Export Control Act I mean they also don't have DFARS and DOD 5000 series although I heard they were trying to copy and we want them to copy the <laughs> DOD 5000 and we'll just give it to them so. <laughs> in the back Rachel Karras with Inside the Air Force. Um, could you speak more specifically about how this budget reflects the new NPR's priorities um, in terms of the funding and the schedule for GBSD, LRSO, and B61? Well, this, this budget, as you'll see, fully funds uh, uh, the development and eventual procurement of, of those capabilities. Um, you, you probably saw that uh, uh, Secretary Mattis was asked again about LRSO, and, and he was a skeptic at first when he was first coming in to, uh, to be confirmed, and then he did a deep dive into the triad and the, and the basis of our nuclear deterrent, and, uh, and he became convinced that, yes, that is absolutely a weapon that we need. So um, you'll, you'll see the budget just fully, fully funds it uh, throughout the fight up until we can get to uh, to fielding on those very critical uh, weapons. Again, the NC3, which the NPR specifically called out, is you, you got to get after that as well, too, to make sure that it's continued reliable. It, you know, make no mistake, we certainly have a safe and reliable nuclear deterrent today, but uh, like all of our systems, they've become aged and they become much more maintenance manpower intensive to maintain uh, and more costly. Yes, ma'am. Deanne Divis, I'm with Inside GNSS. You were talking about the priority that space programs have, and you also mentioned the decades-long uh, process. I'm curious if, in the process of planning things out, if there is an openness to changing the way space is approached. 
to fail smarter, to fail faster, to iterate and change, even even move the constellations or change how they're being handled. Well, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's what you'll see that we're doing right now is is to change the way we're doing this. Uh, uh, you know, it started out years ago as disaggregating space, right? And everybody kind of goes, well, what does that mean? Well, you know, if you take uh, one giant satellite and put every capability in the world you could think of on there, and it takes you many years to develop it, and, and then a, a huge giant rocket capable of launching it up into space, that becomes a vulnerability. Uh, especially if, when you're talking about the previous way, we always looked at space as a benign environment. So we weren't really that concerned about protecting it. Um, you know, the, the Chinese and the Russians have both demonstrated that they're not that concerned about maintaining the benignness of space. So uh, we do now have to worry about it. So, you know, you do want to now disaggregate capabilities, um, especially as we look at, uh, at space launch and the cost of launch coming down and the capability and, and becoming quicker. I mean, like we talked about with Falcon Heavy, when those two big boosters come back, you know, they refurbish them a little bit. Um, you know, Elon Musk has said he wants to get to launches once per day, that he wants to be able to turn it in a day. I mean, now you're talking like airplanes. You know, the thing comes back down, lands, they load it back up with fuel and then launch it the next day. Now, a lot of his own people are kind of going, what? <laughs> um, but, it, but it's along those lines, right? So develop more uh, smaller capabilities that, uh, and, then, and then put them on orbit. And you know, if it's a smaller, less expensive capability, you, you learn what you can out of it, and then, uh, and then you move on to the next. So yeah, I, we're absolutely doing that. I know you're all disappointed I didn't bring the budget handout with all the numbers on it. No. Well, along those lines, you started out talking about SpaceX's um, launch and landing um, last week. Um, when you're talking about um, disaggregating space and the cost of launch coming down, what, what do you think we'll see in, in the budget um, in that regard? Do you see a, a move toward more commercial space capabilities? Well, um, there's, there's space launch and then there's space. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we're doing is, is watching very closely the commercial capabilities. And, and you've heard General Raymond uh, talk many occasions about, hey, we need to take more advantage of, of commercial opportunities. Um, there are some things that we can do that are not as mission critical systems, right? Uh, but when you're talking about mission critical, protected comms, very, very high end national capabilities, then we've, we've got to have that assurance for mission launch that in some cases with commercial is not quite there yet. But, you know, we'll work through that as well. Uh, the most important thing is assured access to space, right? So if something happens to any of the capabilities that we have up on orbit, we need to be able to replace them quickly. And, uh, and that's what General Raymond is working towards. Yes. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, working with the army. You mentioned working with the army on multi-domain battles. With the emphasis on networks and network uh, warfare, how do you? What efforts is the Air Force in it, intending to do things that are going to bring in multiple services as well as uh, potential international uh, coalition partners? Right. Well, it's it's really important. You know, the services are all sort of on the even keel here and. Well, we kind of step out. Uh, uh, General Golfing, as the chief of staff, has, has made this an important effort of his, uh, uh, through his multi-domain command and control effort. And, uh, and he is not doing it by himself. He's, he's certainly talking to his Army and Navy counterparts. So uh, we stay in, in tight with them. Um, you know, at, at the OSD level, uh, they, they'll need to sort of put the umbrella across it all to make sure that we're all going in the same way and same day. Um, but again, the services are, are really taking the lead on that. I think um, that would be a really good question to pose to uh, 
somebody uh, who might be confirmed soon, hopefully, at, in the new research, uh, Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Uh, because at some point, we've, we've got to figure out how that relationship is going to work when they split AT and L out into acquisition and sustainment. And uh, Ellen Lord has said that, you know, she doesn't want to uh, presume anything for uh, whoever might be uh, confirmed into that position and uh, you know to allow them decision space but but that's something that we see them taking the lead on as far as coordinating efforts in that area sir thank you uh, just uh, if i could clarify on the on j stars is there definitely no uh replacement even for the less contested um, in environments, um, and if so, when does the JSTARS uh, platform, existing one, get retired, and do you really expect Congress to go along with that since there's so much support there for the, uh, for the mission? We've, um, you know, one of the things that both Secretary Wilson and General Goldfein have, have emphasized is collaboration with Congress. So um, we've, we've been over there to brief them on several occasions. Uh, to get their concerns and their thoughts on this. Uh, uh, I think John Lehman can attest to that fact that we're certainly involved with Congress to, to help them understand and get through. Now, you know, there are always parochial concerns in, in districts and states, and, and we'll work through those like we do with every, everything else. Um, but, you know, it, like I said earlier, it's not switch one off and switch the other one on. You know, there's a transition through that we have to make sure that we provide the needed capabilities to the to the joint warfighter and the combatant commanders uh, and, as we do. I, there, we'll just say there's no funding in the FY19 budget for that. One more. Time for one more. Hi, so I have a question about Sibbers follow on. Uh, the acquisition strategy was delayed, and uh, last year's budget we saw something of a placeholder in it uh, for the funding should be. So uh, we've heard that in the 19 budget there was going to be an acquisition strategy. Uh, should we expect to see some details hammered out for Sibbers follow on in this budget? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thanks, Mr. Secretary. Yeah. I think you answered everybody's uh, questions, and we very much appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, we have a little something okay. for you. We, we understand that your demands on your time are enormous. So you probably don't have a lot of time to read. But this particular book, uh, the Lafayette Escadrille, uh, is a photo history of the first American fighter squadron. It's pictures, so it's got lots of pictures <laughs> in it. So you can read it, and it's also <laughs> appropriate given that coming up uh, this November uh, marks the uh, 100th anniversary of the conclusion of World War One. So I thanks very much for being here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. I appreciate your time. And thanks very much, this folks.